Thank you so, uh, for that great introduction. So I, I will talk a little bit about history, and, but also lead up to new architectures. I hope that can be entertaining. And already here is the first advertisement for Coindesk. This is an article from 2013. So it's about a sophisticated future for Bitcoin. At that time, we had no blockchain. So the sophisticated future is where we are. Uh, so why I'm mentioning this is because our CTO, Alex Misrai, made the first source code to issue tokens one year before and started this Colored Coins open source project. So that's where we come from. Uh, we started the company a little bit later in 2014. And uh, this is uh, something I take, took from my first business trip here to New York. It was in Brooklyn. There wasn't as much money in this, in this kind of business at that time, so we lived in bank beds, uh, my co-founders and me. Uh, we did have some good times, though, uh, meeting people from the community, like Vitalik that was in the Color Coins product. So this is a picture that sort of uh, shows the direction of the years coming after 2014. You know, Vitalik started Ethereum, a public blockchain. That's a representative of the public blockchains. To the moon with him. And Charlie Schrem is also in the picture, and he got sent to jail for, for illicit money exchange or something like that. We suffered, we represent, well, Charlie represents Bitcoin as a currency. Didn't really take off as we expected. Uh, we represent enterprise blockchain, so we suffered an even worse fate. We started to work with banks and that for years. Uh, but it was pretty cool at the time, we thought, a bank, they wanted to do a stable coin uh, using our technologies. So we thought, this is great. And then we only found two customers. We discovered that weren't that really much interest in the public blockchains from the enterprises. Uh, we learned something here, though, that in order to have good performance of this application, we need to store data in a database. So I'll come back to that later. Uh, so we started, after tokens on Bitcoin didn't work out, we started work with enterprise blockchain, and we did a case for the Swedish land registry. It got us famous in the real estate and blockchain space. It also got us opportunity to develop new technologies. Um, and one of them is a relational blockchain. So combining a relational database with a blockchain into one unit. And why would you do that? Because blockchains aren't really good as databases. A ledger. Have you ever heard a developer before 2015 said, I want to build an application on a ledger. I need a ledger. Why didn't you hear that? Because ledgers look like this. I started code in professionally in 1989, and I used B3. It's a B3. It's a ledger. It's even better than a ledger. But thankful, someone introduced relational databases in a commercial grade. I mean, it's based on, on uh, mathematics from the 70s. Uh, but uh, when this came, it was a really good uh, invention, in a way. Uh, relational databases are great because they are designed to preserve integrity of data using a declarative syntax so, and store it in a very efficient way. So it's impossible to insert er erroneous information if you do it in the right way. It's also data independence, so you can change how things are structured over years behind without changing applications. It's a great technology. I, I don't have to really argue. It's used in all the enterprises across the world. It has over 90% market share. There are several implementations. So, uh, combining a relational database with a blockchain, what do we get? Is it the same as a distributed database? No, it's not, because a distributed database gets worse the more nodes you add, because if you hack one node, you hack the whole system. Uh, a blockchain gets better the more nodes you add. So we did the post-chain. It's a permissioned relational blockchain. We uh, released it at Money20 2017. So we've been working with some enterprise customers using this technology. It's good, they can code in SQL and stuff that they, they understand and have a declarative syntax. It's really, really easy to do powerful applications. So uh, this is the team as it looked in the end of 2017. And then something happens, or we start to dress in other ways and start to talk about freedom on, on, and fairness and things like that. So we actually decided to do something new, go back into the public blockchains. A public blockchain for the public, pretty obvious, but what do we mean with the public, the, the people we want to empower? Uh, 
users should have a control over applications that they are running, not necessarily the application developer forever. So how it's hosted and how it's operated. So this can be designed in, in very different ways. So this is the name of our project, Chromia. Power to the public is our favorite tagline for the moment. We used to call it Chromapolis, uh, but we just recently changed the name uh, because we think Chromia is a little bit shorter and better. So as you read, you can think about who said this. A few of you probably knows I won't do this rhetorical question. I will say it now. It's Vitalik Buterin. But note, he's complaining about the, the, the rules of the game chain. He's not complaining about, I cannot sell the, my NFTs. So blockchain and gaming could be more than NFTs. It's about power, uh, control. You know. If, you, if someone shuts down the service, what will you do with your, with your uh, NFTs? It will just be binary code. You wanted a kitten, right? So you need to have stuff that's resilient. So that's, that's uh, our main focus, getting the logic as well, not only the storage on the blockchain, but the complete game logic for a game. Social media that's controlled by users can even make it as resilient, so if you need to, to change how things work, you can implement a mini-democracy, have users vote. And how was Facebook built on MySQL? We're providing a technology that's just as simple. You know, there's a lot of people that want talking about this, but you need to also have technology that makes it possible to do these things. Uh, and if we have this kind of technologies that are really powerful, I think that we can also onboard some enterprise applications. Because enterprises, as we know, they're less interested in to set up consortium and run nodes. They're interested in what they can get. And there's a lot of applications that can be run on the public blockchain if you have the control and the, the speed and uh, the ease of development, as, as you can do. Yeah, so how do you do this? Again, repeating. A relational blockchain, would you prefer to have the best technology that used in all the enterprises across the world to manage data? Blockchain is about managed data, right? Storing, reading information, and writing information in a secure way. So I'm arguing for the complete market leaders for 40 years. Relational databases combined with blockchain. So that's part of what we do. Uh, we also invented a new consensus mechanism, and before you leave, so <laughs> I must repeat again that we've been working on this for, I think, eight years in our CTO. Uh, he's been doing academic papers on consensus algorithms, etc., and we've, of course, been observing what's going on. So, Our technology is based on PBFT at core, so basically the application decides how many nodes do I want to run my application on, and nodes are run by, by probably reputable server companies and stuff like that. Uh, then there is a staking mechanism involved. So if you misbehave as a node, you can lose money. There's a series of chaining events going on. So first, your application has its own blockchain, but it's anchored into our blockchain. Uh, our being the Chromia network. Of course, not our company that's con gonna control it. We also do anchoring as a last step into Bitcoin and Ethereum in order to have some really resilience if you want to fork this and set up on the moon after a nuclear war or whatever. So we have three kinds of participants, users and power users that typically have read-only on their computers. Uh, and providers are mainly data centers and things like that. So, uh, but you should be able to, to exchange your providers. It should be easy to switch. If you don't like a particular country or a particular operator, you can select another one. So there should be risk involved for misbehavior for providers as well. And at the core of our technology is the application itself. So we usually say that the application developer pays, the, the application pays for, for hosting. So compared to a lot of other blockchains, the users do not need to own the, the, any tokens necessarily. You pay as an application for the hosting that you, you have. And then you can implement your own tokens if you want. For, so this is easy to do with, with the onboarding of, of people that you don't need to send it to an exchange to get tokens to, to play your game or anything. So you decide on the monetization and the governance as well. We would prefer to have user control, 
power to the public application, but we can't force that. But you can implement mini democracies and having maybe even an approval for, for changing the rules. Maybe you have a voting scheme for that. Uh, it's also make it possible to, to turn it off. If the market shares goes down, maybe the users can pitch in for operation. Uh, we have done, you know, we're talking about databases, people become, they think about SQL, which isn't the, the nicest language on the planet, probably. So we did an elegant programming language. So Ulle is a developer, on, <laughs> actually, I asked him to take a selfie yesterday, and this is his elegance of today. Uh, so developers like elegant languages, that's why shitty programmers use PHP and good programmers use Haskell, and stuff like that. Uh, <clears throat> So I can show you a little bit how it looks. The elegance shows itself in few lines of code. In order to insert something, it's like create sport event. Uh, and uh, it's uh, up to one seventh the size of, of uh, SQL. And we have static typing, so it's more secure. An update is also quite, quite elegant, I would say, if you're a code reader. Of course, we have great speed. Uh, a transaction in our system, if you count the number of transactions, maybe up to 1,000, but one transaction in a database could mean pay out dividends to all the shareholders or move all the troops. So that's a complex transaction, not just move a memory cell. And uh, since we're using PBFT, uh, practically Byzantine fault tolerance and a voting scheme, it can, it's really fast as well. Uh, when Moon here goes to Elon Musk that designed the car, the owner of the car, he's a Bitcoin guy from my hometown in Stockholm, Sweden, Christian. Really good license plate, I think. Uh, so, fast transactions. We do have tokens. The application or the application developer, to simplify it a little bit, pays for the hosting of an application. That's why we need a token. It's paid out to the providers who also put tokens at stake. Tokens can also be used to move between applications in the system. And right now, we have this nice language and some sample dApps, a social network. Uh, or like a, a forum in 1,000 lines of codes or something like that. We have a checkers game, maybe not the, the coolest game on the planet, but we can prove that you can quite efficiently do the complete logic, including detecting wins and signing up a list, et cetera, in a very easy way on a platform. So that is something you can try out online. Uh, we're launching a testnet zone, and then, of course, a mainnet after that. And today I can announce that we are doing an IEO, on KuCoin. Uh, we did a previous uh, pre-sale of tokens, um, but we will now open it up for a wider audience on KuCoin on the 28th. Uh, so that's uh, good, we think, but the details about this is something that KuCoin should share rather than us. So what can you do? As a developer, you can try out the technologies. Uh, as a developer, you should learn one new language every year, right? If you read the programmatic program a book. Uh, if you're an entrepreneur, this is a new blockchain, so of course we are ready to support good projects. People that are frustrated with current technologies have great ideas, complex things. That's where we shine. And of course, investors, you saw that slide. Uh, if you want to be a user in the future, we have a, like a mailing list, of course, and the social media that you should subscribe to. And of course, this is a, a serious slide. I will talk in a serious voice. Warning for scammers. Do not ever send ETH to people over Telegram. I, it's sad that this need, has to be repeated all the time. It's not only for our project, but please be careful out there. Any information should come from our official HTTPS controlled sites, dot com sites. Uh, there are several impersonators of myself and others in the team out there. So that's actually uh, faster talk than I thought, but if people have questions, I actually have time, so. Uh, 
I guess they're not prepared for questions. <laughs> Okay, here's a question, at least. I don't have a mic, but uh, I can repeat the oh, question. Oh, okay. Uh, I just, uh, I'm still coming up to speed with your project here. Yeah. But it seems that uh, the development environment um, works with the relational database. Or from it, do I, if I'm a developer, do I bring in my own external relational database? Or is that built into no. your product? Yes, the question is, how do I set up the database? Is yeah. it included, et cetera? Yeah, so for, for our enterprise federated blockchain, you can have your own database installations and we, we sit on a layer on top, integrate with a transaction mechanism, handle the voting and the transmission of messages. But for this public blockchain, it's just a resource. You connect to the system, put in your source code, select providers and they will run the code. So we needed actually to do this language in order to have a more secure setup for, for, um, for a public blockchain. Can't really run SQL randomly. It needs to be deterministic, it needs to be secure. We added static typing, etc. So it's, it's really easy to use. OK, okay then I'll, I'll let you talk unless someone has more questions. Everything clear? Next architecture blockchain? <laughs> it's like the first time I talked about color coins. It was completely silent afterwards. Now, off to next talker about remittances, 2013. <laughs> I've got a question for you. Can you talk a little bit about the rationale of doing an IEO on KuCoin um, on top of your initial series funding? Um, what do you think are the relative benefits of this new kind of fundraising um, method? Yeah, so why an IEO? Uh, uh, we, we got a lot of complaints for having a private sale because people thought this is not the community I want in. But our rationale at the time was this is this is seed funding for a risky project. So we shouldn't really open it up to exchanges. So if you go out on an IPO, you have a qualification about the product. It's like a stable thing. But in this industry, a lot of early products, you've seen all those crazy. So we thought it was a, a good model to, to start off having a, a closed sale, but then we got a lot of, of pressure and people wanted to know where can I participate, etc. So now this uh, is a way for people to spread out uh, and get a chance to get in on the tokens and the, the system, and, yeah, I would say. Okay, thanks again.